Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's prepare our hearts and spirits for a time of prayer with our Lord. Hallelujah, it is Easter morning. Excited and joyful our hearts as the darkness of the past few days is now behind us. And we stand in the light, the bright light of your Son's risen glory. There are many things to celebrate today. Your power over sin and death, the resurrection of your Son Jesus, and the fulfillment of your word in the events that led to the most audacious act of love the world has ever known. God, we praise you and thank you from the depths of our hearts for rescuing us from our sins, for the amazing sacrifice of your Son who bore the sins that should have separated us from you. And now we have the blessing and honor of being with you for all eternity because of what the risen Jesus has done for each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord. Almighty God, because we have been given such an awesome and precious gift, we must share it with others. We cannot keep it to ourselves. Rather, we must spread the word to everyone we know and to those we don't. Let them know that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Help us to find ways to share the gospel with our friends, our families, and our co-workers. Guide us as we share the love that Jesus gave so freely to the lost, the lonely, and the forgotten. Open our eyes so that we may see those around us through Jesus' eyes. We ask your blessings today on those who are hurting or grieving You know those among us who need your healing at this time. We pray also for those who are challenged with money problems or a job that's not very secure. For those who may be wondering where their next meal is coming from. And we pray for Christians around the world who face persecution and trouble and danger in their lives because of their love for you. Gracious God, give us hearts that are loving and obedient as we seek to follow you in all our ways. These things we ask in the name of our Savior Jesus, who reigns with you and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Many months ago, we started our sermon series through the Gospel of John. I believe it was December of 2014. And today, we are going to be uh, finishing that book of John with Scripture from the 21st chapter. And this is Scripture that takes place after Jesus had uh, miraculously fed His disciples, after they fished all night and caught nothing. And it reminds us of the moments on the night that Jesus was betrayed where his disciple Peter denied knowing him three times. Peter, of course, wept bitterly when he saw the face of Jesus after the rooster crowed and realized what he had done. But the scripture tells us also that he went back to the rest of the disciples and here he is now and Jesus comes to speak with him. It says, when they had finished eating... Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time... He said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? 
He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that the disciple, that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Let's pray together for our pastor. Lord, what a remarkable time we've had in this Gospel of John. And today as we come on this Easter Sunday, we celebrate your resurrection. We celebrate all the lessons that we've learned and we celebrate all the lessons that you will continue to teach all of us. But the principal lesson today is that nothing can separate us from you, not even death, Because you conquered the grave, you conquered this enemy, and because you live, we too shall live. So as Pastor Mike comes this morning to share these words with us, we pray that his spirit would be in union with yours, that his words would be in union with yours, and that our ears would hear them. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. of all things, in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, who is our guide and comforter in every uh, day, to our Easter services. Christ is risen. Indeed, he has. You have to pack that in your quiver, because we're going to use that from time to time. Uh, I'm so glad you've come, and if you're new at Marian Methodist, I want to tell you this, because I know it's true. We do this every week. Uh, We celebrate the resurrection of Christ each and every week. We gather here three or four times a weekend, and we invite you back to come and be part of our loving and caring community that worships uh, the everlasting and almighty God. We're glad that you're here this morning. If you're visiting for the first time, uh, we certainly uh, are thrilled to have you. And if you're here again, we're really, really thrilled to have you too. So keep coming on back. Um, We're glad to be part of your life and to be worshiping God with you. Um, I want to tell you, as Keith said, you know, we've been working on the Gospel of John for 15 months, um, and the preaching and the worship doesn't stop there. Next week, uh, we're going to go to some things that are distinctive to we as United Methodists and work some scriptures and, and work why we um, put the cross and flame on our buildings and why we love it. So, uh, and so we hope you'll come back. But that's next week. Today is Easter. And as I've started all 13 of my Easter services here over the 13 years I've been here, I tell you this story. Years ago, when Russia was becoming the Soviet Union, it was important for the leaders of the Communist Party to downgrade, to to seek to crush, to to, uh, uh, eradicate Christianity and religion from the souls of those people that were part of the Soviet Union. So there were meetings all across the state where people were lecturing uh, against Christianity and saying, telling the values of communism. And, and while that's fallen, it's still important for us to hear, hear because it, it, it resonates in where we're at right now. So there was a fellow named Bucharin, as the story goes, and he was a big leader and he stood up in Leningrad and he began to teach the people on the foolishness of Christianity, on how the pillars of the faith were made up hokum. It was simple mythology. There was no truth to it. And the only truth they needed to know were the guidelines of the party communists because the way that forward was a godless society and they needed that not. And after he, in his great verbose speech, 
thought he had just absolutely crushed the faith of everybody that was gathered. After he looked out on that people and saw what he thought were the smoldering remains of the particles of their faith, he simply asked, is there any questions? Does anyone have a question? And a little fellow, an older man from the side of the stage, walked up slowly to the microphone, looked, looked at the leader, this giant communist leader, and took his place behind the microphone. And then to the 10,000 folks gathered there in that arena, he simply issued and offered the ancient Orthodox greeting. He said before them all, Christ is risen, risen is what every single voice that was gathered there said. Because they knew the truth that while some may speak against the truth, uh, that, that it didn't make it untrue. The simple truth of all creation is Christ is risen. Indeed, he has. And Christianity is not based on mythology. It's not based on a bunch of myths. It's not based on the movies that might be in the movie theater. It's based on one thing. Christ is risen. And Christ, Christianity doesn't center itself on some formula for better living that you can go to the deep pockets of Amazon.com or over into the self-help section at, at Borders or Barnes and Normal. Christianity is not centered on those things. It's based on a simple reality. Christ is risen. Indeed, he has. And Christianity is not even based, hear this, hear this carefully, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. Christianity is not based on the scriptural text. Its basis is told through the scriptural text, but there are words on the page. The simple fact and center of Christianity is Christ is risen. Indeed, he has. And Christianity, then, is based on a person. See, it's the only religion in the world that's based on a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. And let me talk to you about him clearly and directly this morning. You see, there came a point in the all-knowing, all-powerful life and mind of God, where as he called to humanity, he thought the best methodology through which they will understand me is a person. So the great God, the one and only, becomes human in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. That's called incarnation. He becomes incarnate. He takes on flesh and blood because what God knows is what we know. We relate to things better when they're three, in three dimensions. I can relate to Vicki and Keith because I can see them. I can touch them. I can, I can hear all the sights and sounds of them. So I know that they're real and why Jesus came to earth was so that God could show us that he was real because we can have relationships with that which is real. We have a hard time having a relationship with the air. But the relationship with the real, we can have. And all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, invite you and me and everybody that was and is and will be to meet this person, this Jesus, our Savior, and have a relationship with him. Because relationship is what we need. We, we don't need guidelines. That comes later. We don't even need all the structure of the religion that comes by. We need a relationship. And then in relationship with Christ, we'll get in relationship with others that have relationship with Christ and form groups like a church. So that we can live out that relationship together and the expectations of it. But you see, the resurrection relationship is a permanent thing. See, Jesus didn't just come back for a few days and then go off. For the rest of forever. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a permanent condition. It's a permanent condition so that every generation can know personally. And that's why I cry out. Christ is risen. In indeed he has. Now, now the resurrection in its most rudimentary form is a coming back, right? I mean, Jesus was here. And then at the cross, he died. Joseph of Arimathea and others put him in the grave. So he was here and he left. And on Easter Sunday, we see the stone rolled back so that we can come in and see that he's gone. But where had he gone? He was not away. He came back. And so I started thinking a few weeks ago when I began to prepare the, the, the nuts and bolts of this sermon. I said, what, what is resurrection at its root, most rudimentary form? It's a coming back. It, it's a been somewhere coming back to it. So I, so I thought to myself, Mike, because that's what I call myself, Mike, 
what do you come back for? When you've gone somewhere, what will you come back for? And so I, I thought of a few times in my history where I've been away from my home. And, and I thought, what, what do I come back for? And, and so in Easter, I, I thought I'd share these three things with you. I, I'll go back for the valuable. If I'm going somewhere else, and we've left behind something valuable, I'll go back for it. I'll go back anywhere for something valuable. I, you've all had this, those of you that have raised children. You know, I raised a couple of kids to adulthood, and they're Christians, and God bless them, and yay us, and Jesus, and all that kind of stuff. I'm so proud of them. And when they were little, they were normal. <laughs> so you've had that, right? And more times than enough, than, than one or two, I can remember we're going to grandma's house, or we're going on some trip somewhere, and I'll drive out, I'll get on the highway, and I'll be going about two miles away from home, and they'll say, Dad, Dad. I'm like, what, what? They said, I forgot my water bottle. Can we go back for it? And I think to myself, is a water bally, bally, b- bottle valuable enough to go back for? And I said, oh, honey, I, I'm sorry. To keep your saliva up, you're going to have to suck on a button or something like that, because I'm not going back. I'm not going back for that. That's not valuable. We'll be at Grandma's house, and in 100 miles, you probably won't get dehydrated and go insane. You'll be fine. But what do you go back for? You know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, so I'm going to expose myself to a little bit of embarrassment now. A couple of weeks ago, and this ties together, my iPad said, you need an OS upgrade. So... I started it, and then it said, you need to turn off your iPad finder for this to work. So I did. And it all upgraded, and it was wonderful. I could read things faster and see things better, according to Apple. And so I went, well, that's what they told me. Um, It was on the Internet, so you know it's true. So I went to Starbucks and on Collins Road and I thought, well, I'll enjoy a cup of coffee. It's my day off. And I was sitting there reading emails and, and various things that pastors look at on the Internet. And then one of you, one of, one of my beloved congregation members came in and, and just come in social. They didn't, weren't looking for me. They just came in. And, and so I, I, I got up. I put my iPad on, on the floor beside my chair. You know, it was an up, upright like a book. And I walked over and I, you know, hugged and talked and shared for a few minutes and then I said, uh, Mike, because that's what I call myself, it's time to go. So I walked out. Yeah. <laughs> and I got home and I said, I should check my email. And I went to check my email and I said, where's my iPad? And I said, oh, I know where it's at. So I went back because it was valuable. Now, unfortunately, Starbucks doesn't have an iPad storage room. So I searched the, the restaurant, and the manager met me and said, Sir, we don't have your iPad. And I said, No problem. I got my I- iPhone. I'll find it. Well, th- it never came back. But I went back for it because it was valuable. Wouldn't you go back for something valuable like that? Some of you have turned around because you left game tickets or plane tickets, or some of you have left a kid, and you've gone back every time. <laughs> right? Because we return for the valuable. We always do. We return for the valuable. And and so what do you go back for? We go back for the valuable, and we also go back to clarify expectations. You know, I I had, you know, all of us that live in Northeast Marion, a couple years ago we had that bad hailstorm. We all got new roofs, you know. I was getting my new roof during that thing, and several years back in in a different home, I had to get a new roof as well, similar kind of circumstance, but, but the, the roofers did a, a below average job of picking up all those little nails. You know, they went around with the magnet, but they did it really fast. And so like for about two years, I was flinging nails all over the neighborhood with my lawnmower. So, so when I was leaving, I went home at lunch to kind of make sure the job was going well and that, you know, the, they were putting the shingles right side up and everything like that. And so when I was leaving for lunch, I said to one young guy that was standing by the truck, I said, hey, make sure you go around the yard twice with that magnet thing and pick up all the nails. And he said, okay, yeah, we'll do that. And I got, you know, about 10 blocks from home, and I thought, I don't think he was the boss. So I went back and called the boss down from the roof and explained my intention. And I'll say this. I wanted to clarify my expectations. And I'll say it in guy terms because I'm a guy. You know pick up the nails, I know cash the check. Okay? And those expectations were clear. I haven't found a nail in years. 
See, we'll go back to clarify expectations. And I also think that when we're, we've left somewhere, we'll go back to extend the experience. If we're really enjoying something, sometimes we leave and we go back. Have you ever done that? You know, Keith and I and, and some of the rest of you are involved in a ministry we call Summer Games University. We go to Grinnell College, rent the whole thing for a week, we have worship every night. And at the end of the night, you know, when we get our college students to, to go back to the dorms with our, with our young kids, uh, junior high and high school kids, and we get them calming down for the night, the pastors and, and spouses and, and musicians and others, we get together. At night, we have a party every single night. We have snacks, we have hanging out, and it's always in somebody's room. Sometimes it's in my room, sometimes it's in somebody else's room. This year it was in somebody else's room. We get together and we just celebrate the fact that that night, that particular night, that God be praised, some kids have come to Christ, and there's been these meaningful experiences. And then we just kind of really tease the preacher of that day a little bit about what they said or something silly that happened or when their microphone turned off or when they fell off the stage or something like that. And we just really are, are there enjoying ourselves, embracing each other. But this year, you know, I'm past 55, so it got to be about, you know, 11.30 midnight, and I said, I'm going back to, I'm going to bed. I wasn't really tired. <coughs> I was trying to be responsible, you see. I was trying to be responsible. I had to get up early in the morning, so about 11.30, I said, I'm going to go back to bed. And about 15 minutes after I'd been back in my room, I hear this uproarious laughter. I said, sounds like fun. I'm going back. And I walked in the room and sat down and was having a Ritz cracker or something. And young Simon, our worship technology director, said, I thought you left. I said, I did, but it sounds so much fun. I want to come back. See, we'll go back to extend a fun or a blessed experience. We go back to extend experiences with joy. And I believe that Jesus' resurrection from the dead, I believe his coming back has parallels to those reasons that we come back. I think he comes back for the valuable. I think he comes back to clarify expectations. And I think he comes back to extend the experience. See, I think that Jesus comes back because we're valuable. We are valuable to him. In the very first sermon of this sermon series, we read from John chapter 1, 14. And Keith's dad, Tony talked about how uh, this scripture comes up. The word became flesh and he made his home among us. I I want you to just think about this for a second. You know, this is the God of all creation that's seen every corner of the galaxy because he made it, you know. So he decided to live among us. It was a choice. You know, you don't live among strangers. You don't live about among people you don't care about. You don't live among, you know, folks that you just collect on the way home from church. Say, hey, come on over and let's live with me for a while. That's not how it goes. You live where you want to live. You live with who you cherish. And not only that, it says this in, gospel, in John's gospel. It said, God sent his son into the world not to judge it, but to save it. You see, Jesus saw the world that, that, that had been made by he and the Father and the Holy Spirit and said, this is worthy. This is valuable to me. But it's gone a little bit sideways, so I'm going to go down there and give my possibility of relationship with those because they're valuable. And it's because we're valuable, you see. It's because we are valuable that Christ is risen. I agree with you. He has risen indeed. And that we are valuable because we're his. We are valuable because we're his. He has stated that, you see. When you look at something that's valuable, you say, why is something valuable? Usually it has something to do with the origin of the piece or the ownership of it, and sometimes both. When I worked at Simpson College in the early 90s, I was the college chaplain and special assistant to the president. That second part, special assistant to the president, meant that during the summer, I was a, 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 I called myself a low-level fundraiser. I would go to those folks that were alumni of the college or that loved the college, go to their homes or their apartments or wherever, and talk to them about the wonderful Christian ministry that we were having at Simpson College in the chapel program, and ask them for their annual pledge. And most of the time, they'd write a check for me. On one particular experience, I was sent to a guy named Bill Buxton. Any of you in banking might know who Bill Buxton was. He was the beginner of Brenton Banks. Mr. Buxton was a huge supporter of Simpson College, and he had an annual pledge of $25,000. He was the kind of guy that would come to the Habitat for Humanity potato bar and write a $1,000 check for two potatoes. So he had capacity and an inclination for the college. But I was every summer to go get his $25,000 check. So I thought, very simple, after lunch, kind of task one day, went over, had coffee with Mr. B. 
said, I'm here to pick up your pledge check. And he says to me, well, I've been thinking about that. And I'm like, oh, cool. He says, you know, this year I'd like to give you a cash in kind gift instead. My daddy gave me a painting. He said it was worth a lot of money. I'd like you to take the painting. I'm thinking, awesome. So he drags me down into the bottom of this place called the village in, Webs- in, in, in uh, Indianola. And there is a, a painting. It's six foot six in length and it's crated. It, it's crated. And so I thought, well, and he told me, he says, I'll, I'll pay up to the 25000 if you want to. But you take this over to the art department, see if it's worth anything. My dad said it was always worth something. So I picked it up because he's 87 or something like that. I picked it up. And I didn't, I, I slid it. I didn't throw it, but I slid it into the back of my pickup, but it's six foot six and that's the length of my bed. The, the gate won't shut. So I thought, well, it's only eight blocks over to the college. I'll drive slow. So I drove my little Nissan pickup over the college and it's summer, no students around. So I, I pull right up on the, on the sidewalk up to the art department. I muscle that thing out and I kick the door open, drag it in. And I put it down and I said, Dr. Heineke, she comes from one of the upper regions, the art building. I said, I brought this back. And she cuts it off and the tarp falls out of it. And, 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 and when I see this painting, I, I, you know, I had this movie. It was so ugly. I kind of threw up in my mouth a little bit. It was so ugly. This is what Dr. Heineke, the art expert, says. Oh, she walks, starts walking backwards. Oh, Michael, what do we have here? Well, I don't know the name of the guy that painted it, but she did. That painting that rode in the back of my car sold for $403,000 at South Visa, London, because of the originator. Not because it was a beautiful painting, because it wasn't. To me, I thought someone made a huge mistake. (laughs) And I like art. I love art. But it was because of who made it. It was because of this artist. You see, in Genesis chapter 1, God says, let us make man in our image. So, male and female, he created them. In the image of God, they were made. You see, our value has to do with our originator. It has to do with who created us. Our value, which is infinite, comes from not a monetary number, but from the Lord of heaven and earth who says, your value is infinite. You understand that? It's because your value is infinite that Christ is risen. But drink that in. I oftentimes hear people tell me that they're not valuable. And I said, of course you're valuable. You're made by God. You're one of his kids. And if he says you're valuable, you're worth a lot. So value comes from our origin. It also comes from our ownership. I have this little elephant that is... um, If you saw it, it's a little glass elephant with gold-painted ears, you would say, oh, that's sweet. Pastor Mike went to a flea market. You would. I understand that. But it has tremendous value for me because you wouldn't pay 25 cents for it at a flea market. You wouldn't. But years and years ago, I had this little secretary. She truly was little and she was sweet. Her name was Millie, Miss Millie. Miss Millie would, would, she was a volunteer, she would come over and she would, she, I, I would give her notes or dictate to her and she'd type it. She used to work at the Pentagon when she was younger. She would type all my seminary papers because, you know, we had electric typewriter at the church. And I'd give her the notes, she'd type them out. She served God by serving me in tremendous ways. And one day I was dropping Millie off at her house and I helped her in her house and I saw on her console TV, so you get the age group here, you know, the time in, in play. There's this little, this little elephant on there. And I said, Millie, I love that thing. That's gorgeous. I couldn't think of anything else to say, so I said that. It's a little glass elephant. You know, when Millie died, she wrote on her will that I should have that. You could not rip it out of my house because she owned it. And that's what gave it value. That's why it has value of high esteem. So if you're in my house, you'll, and well, now if you're in my house, you'll say, where's the elephant? And you shall see it. But our ownership is in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, when he's talking to Peter, he doesn't say to him, hey, Peter, go Tend the lambs. 
go feed the people. He says, tend my sheep, feed my lambs, care for my flock. You see, Jesus is staking down the ownership. We belong to God. We're given our value by God because he is our originator, our creator, and we, have, uh, we are under the ownership of God, and our value comes from the one who creates and owns us. That's why he came back for us. That's why he came, he lived, he left. That's why he comes back for it. That is the reason Christ is risen. And Jesus is able and willing to restore our value if we've diminished it. If somehow we've diminished our value, Jesus can restore it for us. See, Peter had done the exact opposite of what he said he would do. He said he'd be the leader of the church. He said he would never deny Christ, and yet he did. And Jesus and Peter did the exact opposite of what Jesus wanted him to do. Jesus had said, Peter, upon you, I will build the church. You're the rock. He also told him later when he saw his faith wavering that he would deny him. But there on the seashore, in the last story of the Gospel of John, Jesus forgives him and restores him. Now restore, understand what restore is. Restore is made of full original value. If you came into the world of infinite value and worth to God, when you are restored, you are the same. It's not like you got new parts. It's that you have God parts. You're better off restored than diminished. See, it's for Peter's restoration. Christ is risen. And he also comes back to restore your value. He does. See, our intentions, our inclinations, our efforts fall short. And we sometimes act opposite of our hopes for ourselves. And we often act opposite of God's hope for us. We, we fall short of the mark. We're broken. We're blemished. We're dark. We're filled with, with sin and regret. And so it's for our forgiveness. It's for our restoration. It's for our reconciliation. Christ is risen. Indeed, he does. And Jesus not only comes back to show that we're valuable to him, he comes back to clarify expectations. See, three times he says to, to Peter, Peter, do you love me? You know, the third time, Peter gets a little bit exasperated. And he says, Lord, you know I love you. I love the King James. I study a number of versions when I'm getting ready for a sermon. I love the King James version when, when, when Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, oh, Lord, thou knowest. Thou knowest. I don't say thou very often, so I wanted to say it on Easter. Uh, for those of you that might be visiting. Th- thou knowest. Thou who knows everything. Thou knowest my heart. And Jesus then states his expectations. Follow me. That's it. Follow me. And Peter restored with new purpose and opportunity unyieldingly from that moment on lives and gives his life for Christ and his church. See, complete restoration presents you with a new opportunity. Follow me then and now means as the Father has sent me, so now I send you. The broken, dying, and shackled and oppressed of this world, they cannot get up. They cannot move. They cannot speak for themselves. But the restored can help them pick up their lives and follow Jesus. The restored, that's you and me, if we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The restored can live with new purpose, with great purpose of testifying to Jesus' reality and serving his other children. See, it's for that. It's for that new opportunity that Christ is risen. Indeed, he has. And so follow me means shaping our lives after his and caring for his sheep that are the people in the world in every possible way. Thomas Akempis wrote a book, The Imitation of Christ. I've read it. I went to seminary. I had to. It's great. But the title says it all. That's what our lives are supposed to be. An imitation of Christ, of what he is and what he does. And and when you look at how it is that we're supposed to imitate Christ, I, I, I encourage you, I admonish you to look someday at Matthew 25, especially the last half, because in the last half of Matthew 25, we receive the only theological examination that there is in the whole scriptures. In, in all the New Testament, Jesus puts this theological expectation before us. When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did, did you give me water, something to drink? When I was sick, did you come and pray for me? When I was in prison, did you visit me? So on and so forth. See, here's what the Christian examination needs to be. We need to notice. 
We need to notice the brokenness of the world. We need to stop not being shocked by how broken things are. Let me give you an example. Those of you that went to school and those of you who lived this, how many people died in the Holocaust? Six million. Now, Marion and Lindmar must be suffering a little bit. Don't they teach you that? Six million Jews died in the Holocaust. You knew that, right? You nod as if yes. Six million. That's a giant city of people. And we were shocked and appalled by that. Do you know how many people have died in Africa by ethnic cleansing over the last 15 years? Ten and a half million. Are we shocked? Are we mortified? One of the jobs of the Christian that loves Jesus is to try to care for the people of the world in every way possible. We need to, know, we need to notice that there's brokenness. We need to notice the oppressed. We need to notice the spiritually bankrupt in our world because it's a plague that's growing and growing. And once we notice, we need to care about it. We actually need to, to, to allow our hearts to break. We need to allow our knees to bend in prayer. And we need the tears to flow from our eyes. And we need to spend ourselves completely and fully for this. Using every breath, every resource in our hands and our disposal to care for Jesus' sheep. You may not remember it, but I do because it was my first sermon here. When I preached my first sermon here in July of 2003, I said this, that the churches that I want to serve and the church that I will direct will breathe its first breath and spend its last penny caring for the people of God. That is what we shall do. And who are the people of God? All the people in the world. This is what our responsibility is. See, it's for people with that heart. It's for people that care about others. It's for people that are willing to spend themselves for others. It's people that are willing to be, allow themselves to be broken for others. It's for people like that, that Christ is risen. Indeed, he has. And Jesus comes back to extend the experience. It's kind of odd to me that the creator of earth enjoys being so mu- with us so much that 33 years was not enough for us. I've known some people that have known me and say, hey, Mike, a week with you is enough. Right? A- amen. Why was it loudest by these two? Uh, But Jesus has 33 years of human life with us, and he discerns that that's not enough. No, no, no. He wants to know you forever. He wants you to be with him forever. Imagine that. The king of the universe has time for you. Not only does he have time for you, he wants to spend it all with you. And it's for that that Christ is risen. Indeed, he has. And it's not a fad. It's not a passing phase. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a permanent condition. It's here forever. And that permanence calls us to a better way, a way of living and loving and serving with all of his people in the world, desiring them to come in relationship with him. See, Easter reminds us that in every generation, our Lord needs fearless followers. Brothers and sisters, I have to tell you, we are living in a post-Christian age, or I like to say, because of the work we're doing, a pre-Christian age. Because... The bankruptcy of spirituality around us. We have a lot of people that are spiritual but not religious. But we need all people. You know, we, we, we every single day wake up and say, what is our mission statement? Our mission statement is to follow Jesus in such a way that that great day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord on heaven and earth happens to him. And so, so we need to be the fearless followers of Jesus in this generation. We need to say yes to him in every way we can. And we need to be ensured that when we say yes to Christ, we shall be okay. We will take risk and we will fail. We will do things that won't always work. But Romans 8 tells us that nothing in heaven and earth or above or around can separate us from Jesus Christ. He is going not just a little bit of the way with us. He's going all the way with us and he's already waiting for us where we intend and are inclined to be. And he has nowhere else that he would love to be and there is nowhere else he will go but to be with you. And that is why the limitless Christ offers to be the author of your life. Now hear this because I'm going to take you home with this. In John chapter 1 it says if everything he did was written down there wouldn't be enough room in all the world for the books about what he'd done. 
Think about that. The world would be unlivable because of the ledgers of the activity of Jesus Christ. One of those stories he wants to write is your story. And so I'm here to ask you today. To hear the call of Jesus Christ on your life, who simply says to you, follow me. Follow me. Let me write the really notable parts of your life story. Follow me and let me write down the things that will truly be remembered forever. See, the opportunity and decision is yours to claim or reject Jesus. That's that what we love about Jesus. See, the book of John simply is, is John's case lay, laid out. And the, really the last lines he's saying in our language today, he's saying, you read it, you decide. You read my presentation of Jesus you decide. For 15 months, we've been reading it. And today I say, decide. See, i got to tell you from the bottom of my heart, I believe Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And he did that for you and for me. See, this is why he came back. And I'll make this unapologetic invitation to you. See, if you're coming and you've just been dabbling in a religion... Or if you're coming just because you respect someone and they wanted to come to church, God bless you. What a wonderful gesture of love you've made. If you've come because there's some openness in your life that needs to be filled with something, I just want to make this invitation with clarity. Jesus Christ is the Lord of all the earth. And you are valuable to him. And he already owns you. But the maximization of that ownership is if you allow him to know that you love that. See, to become a Christian, you really only need to do these things. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior, that he came and he lived and he died and he was resurrected for his glory and so that you might come into relationship with him. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then receive him into your heart and allow the Holy Spirit to come over you and spend every single moment of your life listening to God as he coaches you and coaxes you to live the life that he would have you live. See, don't miss that, friends. If today is your day, if this Easter 2016 is your best day, I mean, I prayed before this sermon with these guys up here that we would end today with more Christians Then we started the day. Now, I don't get any notches in my belt. But what happens is, if that is true, is that some of your lives become more full and more useful for the world and for the kingdom that God is building. It's for that purpose. Christ is risen. Indeed, he has. Ushers, will you help us with our offering?